Well, welcome and thank you so much for joining us this afternoon for our final presentation in our series, Ready to Learn. And today we will be discussing trauma-informed strategies. Hi, my name is Nancy Bird and I'm Director of Training and Development at RCL Benziger. And just a few housekeeping tips as we begin our time today. Uh, this uh, webinar is being recorded and so your microphones and cameras are off. However, please locate on the Zoom toolbar either the Q&A feature or the chat feature because we will be using that throughout the our time together. And I think Amy has a few things she's going to be asking you to do in the chat as well. You can relax, uh, take a deep breath, and know that we will send you the recording link along with a PDF of Amy's PowerPoint for you to view at your convenience and or share with some of your faculty and staff in your parish or school. So sit back and enjoy. Um, I, it is my pleasure to introduce to you Amy Kromberg. Uh, she's an early learning consultant and adjunct professor at the University of Dayton. Amy began her work in early childhood education at the University of Mission Dearborn Early Childhood Education Center, where she learned about the Reggio, am I saying that right? Reggio Amelia philosophy, a child centered curriculum, and playful learning environments. I love about the playful learning environments. She moved to Dayton in 2013 to complete her Master's of Science in Education, studying early childhood leadership and advocacy so she could learn to support children and families as they learn to value and celebrate play. She is currently all in but her dissertation in educational leadership at the University of Dayton and specializes in early learning consulting for local, nonprofits, infant and toddler learning and social emotional development. She is also the star, Miss Amy, of RCL Benziger's new My Emotions video series supporting Stories of God's Love um, early childhood program. So without any further ado, Miss Amy, it's all yours. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. And thank you to all of you who are joining us today or who are watching this as playback. Um, so appreciate you taking some time to think about the needs of our children and making sure that they are ready to learn and we have tools to support them. Um, throughout our time together today, I will be um, sharing whenever possible a little chat box that says um, to type in your responses. Um, there we go, just like this. It'll show this little speech bubble and you can go ahead and respond in the chat. We will start with, who are you? Um, are you a teacher, administrator? Are you somebody else that works with children? What age group do you work with? I always used to joke that everybody has that perfect age of child that they love to work with. For me, it was four-year-olds. They have such big questions. They, you can really see the gears start to turn until I became a parent to my now four-year-old. And I realized I really love the pace of infants and toddlers. So go ahead and share in the chat box who you are. Um, what age group you work with so that I can use that information as we go through our slides today. Um, I am also joined by Miss Amy McEntee, the other Miss Amy, um, and she'll <laughs> be jumping in to share some of your responses aloud as well. Thank you. So look, watching the chat here, which is people are answering quickly, we have uh, several directors of religious education and parishes, um, some kindergarten teachers, preschool teachers, an assistant principal, preschool director, uh, a teacher of pre-K through eighth. Wow, that's that's the range there. <laughs> um, parish administrator for kids and families, K through eighth. A middle school teacher, some more K through eight. Uh, let's see, director of faith formation and was a theology teacher in junior and senior high. Work, work and love all the kids, I agree. Um, teacher for toddlers, middle school catechist, 
administrator for five-year-olds, uh, youth ministry, again, lots of parish staff here, preschool through high school, some more middle school. We got the whole gamut here. I was you know? just gonna library say, oh, manager. <laughs> <laughs> it's like we brought the whole gamut, pre-K to um, eight. We've got directors, administrators, teachers. Wow, wonderful. Thank and you. A, so much. And a few friends from the University of Dayton. <laughs> Ooh, fires. Um, so glad to have you all joining us today. Um, later on in the presentation, I will be asking you all to share ideas about ways you can use the strategies we're talking about today in your classroom or in your program. So I'll be sure to give a couple of examples for how you can use these strategies in a variety of ways. And remember, these are just ideas. You don't have to commit to them, um, but feel free to collaborate in the chat. Um, share email addresses when we're all done so that you can connect with colleagues. Um, it's always my goal in a presentation like this that I'm not just the talking head that's pouring knowledge into these empty vessels, but rather that you walk away with something you can use um, that can help you, you know, ease that burden a little bit, help lighten that load. All right. So I want to give a little bit of background about stress, about um, acknowledging the struggles, the challenges we have collectively been through together as educators in a variety of capacities. And then we'll talk a little bit about what we can do about it. So a little bit of what I like to call the brainy background before we dive into practical strategies for how we can set ourselves up for success in this coming school year. So I am going to talk a little bit about COVID and policies, um, but just know that anytime I'm talking about some of these issues of toxic stress, it goes beyond COVID, that a lot of the issues that we see every day in working with children and families were they existed long before COVID existed. They, the last two years have really put a spotlight on existing challenges. It really has amplified some of the struggles that we have in working in education. And so I use COVID as the example because we had a lot of policy changes in rapid succession. Um, if you work with preschoolers and young children, you'll know that there are cleaning protocols that have changed. Um, you know, ratios, we have fewer um, children in the classroom, desks need to be spread out for social distancing, um, temporary closures due to exposure. Um, and up through working with older kids, right? Less group work, more individual work at risk for spreading disease. And hopefully um, we won't have as many of those particular issues into this school year, but it is something that has changed our frame of reference. It's changed the way that we approach children interacting with one another. And especially for our kiddos that have had a school experience before, this year will be different. They carry those restrictions with them, right? Is it safe for me to hug my teacher? Is it safe for me to do these things? Those policy changes that were created to support young children have lasting implications on children's ability to connect with one another and to connect with us. Um, we also have, you know, larger programming changes such as pandemic closures, right? Being closed for days or a couple of weeks at a time. The joy or challenge that is remote learning as well. How can we authentically connect with children when we don't see them, when there is a glowing screen sort of connecting us and all of the challenges that go along with it? You know, mask requirements, are we able to have those kind of authentic connections when only half of our face is showing? Um, how do children know that we are happy as their teacher if they can't see our smiles, right? You know, vaccine requirements, having limited number of adults in the classroom, all of these are things that have an impact on 
our mental load as well. These are things that weigh on us that are sort of that dull hum that's now in the back of our heads, right? Am I keeping myself safe? Am I keeping the children safe? Are they learning what they need to learn? Um, all of those are things that sort of keep us in that emotional state or survival state frame of mind. Um, and when we're in that frame of mind, it can be difficult to focus on connecting with children, on connecting them with content, on connecting with families. We're all coming in with this baggage of, you know, how can I do my job? How can I best serve my community? How can I have that active service sort of mindset when it feels like there's so many barriers to making it happen? And again, some of these practical implications of COVID, um, as well as any sort of trauma here in Dayton in particular, we are no strangers to collective trauma over the last few years, right? There are tornadoes and community violence and pandemics, all of these things that impact our ability to support and connect with one another. Go ahead and put in the chat some concerns that you have for this school year. Um, and I'll go over some of these concerns about mental health um, while you guys are going ahead and adding your responses into the chat. Some of our concerns about mental health are for children, right? Worrying if children have the skills that they need to make friends to, especially in those young um, age groups and our, our our pre-K, kindergarten, first, second, third grade, right? Are they coming into the classroom ready to learn? Or are they worried about their safety? Are they worried about making friends? Are they worried about, um, you know, staying healthy? But it's also important for us to consider the concerns about mental health for ourselves as adults, right? Are you struggling to connect with the children on an emotional level, right? Do you feel like you're just rushing through, rushing through because there's this pace of you have so many things that you need to accomplish in so little time? Do you feel, you know, triggered by challenging behavior that you haven't seen in the classroom before? Um, and how can you help families cope when you might be struggling to cope in the classroom as well? Um, as my friend and colleague Amy likes to say, she loves to share the story, um, this quote from a friend of hers, COVID did something to these kids. Um, and it is so true. We are seeing behavioral challenges in kiddos that we haven't necessarily seen um, as widespread before. As a parent to a four-year-old, I can tell you there are things that he has experienced that I never expected him to, right? A connection to things instead of people because he was so sheltered from interacting with other kids for so long. Um, and what weight do we carry um, as adults with that as well? Again, early childhood spotlight here, that balance of keeping kiddos safe and making sure that they are able to learn in a hands-on playful learning environment those concerns about challenging or mistaken behavior. But from an administrator point of view, finding that balance between allowing your staff to have the resources and support that they need, taking the time to stay healthy themselves, and also balancing that with the learning expectations for children, those outcomes-based um, ideas that we may have. So we're getting a lot of responses over in the chat to those concerns for this year that range from, you know, fear of being shut down again to, uh, you know, some of the behavioral issues that are related to having not been in school, um, burnout, both students and teachers, uh, the the lack of socialization skills, as, as you were saying, just because they haven't they haven't had the opportunity to to know what a normal um, environment is. Uh, being able to differentiate between kids who are having learning issues and thus those who just don't know how to, to act in a classroom environment, um, high expectations that, that 
that that schools will teach coping skills rather than parents. You know, so how do we how do we manage who who's responsible, um, and then also how do we help? So lots of good concerns and you know valid valid issues here. Things that we're that we all are are addressing in various ways. Wonderful. Thank you all so much for your responses. Um, and I feel those, right? The concerns for behavior, um, being the primary teacher of children. Um, you know, as a millennial, I always joke that we were taught to fill out Scantron tests. We weren't necessarily taught to care for others or consider our emotions. Um, social emotional learning is a big part of my advocacy for early childhood as well. As you can see in the um, Stories of God's Love, my emotions video series. Um, and so I'll spend just a little more time here talking about mental health before we step into some ways to address those concerns, practical strategies that you can use. Um, one of you said that um, social interaction, supporting kiddos who haven't really had informal or formal social learning opportunities. We'll talk about ways to, to help you connect with those kiddos. Um, but first, I want to spend a little bit of time spotlighting mental health, taking a little bit of a deeper dive here. Um, part of an important part of the conversation with kiddos of any age and in self reflection for us as adults is understanding how this feels in the body, right? Understanding the difference between positive, tolerable, and toxic stress. And it's important to note that not all stress is bad. Um, that we have some positive stress, right? You are, you react to, you know, having to slam on your brakes while you're driving or, you know, stopping before you bump into somebody, right? It's this brief moment of an elevated heart rate, a little bit of elevation of stress hormones, right? It's, it's your body's natural response to an event, right? And then we have tolerable stress, right? It's serious, it's temporary stress responses, but it's buffered by supportive relationships. Maybe you are struggling with a project with work, right? You're trying to figure out how to implement a new policy mandate, or you're trying to figure out how to, you know, get a program up and running. You are able to work through those challenges and, you know, sort of like exercising, right? It's a little bit heavier weight lift, but you are able to handle it because you have supportive relationships to, to work with. And then there's toxic stress, which is this prolonged activation of stress response in the system um, in the absence of protective relationships. When we think about this in the classroom, we don't necessarily know what a child's stressors are. We don't necessarily know what the family is going through. We don't know um, their home environment. We might have a glimpse of it based on our connections with families, but we don't necessarily see the full picture. So it's always important to think about the common thread between these three types of stress. And it's that supportive relationship that as the teacher that is spending time with kiddos in the classroom, as the administrator who is creating, you know, family engagement opportunities, it is that responsive, supportive relationship that can be a protective factor. Again, just a little bit more information about types of stress, just a couple of things to highlight. You can review these in the notes that will be sent at the end of this webinar as well. But again, positive stress is short-lived. Tolerable stress is a little bit more prolonged. And toxic stress is pervasive. It trickles through all sorts of um, times of the day. It's, it is always there. It is sort of this baggage that you carry with you. And so through our faith, through our relationship with God, through our relationship with others, we are hopefully able to mitigate some of the effects of that toxic stress, you know, keep it in that tolerable stress level. So essentially, um, we have this cycle of stress. I wrote about this with my colleague, Dr. Adams. Um, and so one of the things that we can note about this cycle of stress is the role of the adult 
in this cycle with children, right? It's not just a child is stressed out. A child is giving me a hard time, but rather that child is having a hard time. And what is my role within that? Especially with young children, we are co-regulated to them. They respond to our energy levels. They respond to our stress levels. And that can be a heavy weight, um, a heavy burden to bear. But essentially, when we're talking about stress, an adult experiences some sort of stressful event, whether that is navigating a pandemic or trying to figure out how to balance the paperwork, the mental load of teaching with you know, the needs of the child and, and our personal life and things like that. But essentially, an adult experiencing experiences that stress or that stressor. That stress impacts the way we approach an interaction with a child. If you're feeling triggered or something, you know, you might be short with a child. Um, in the classroom, you know, a child might ask for the 14th time if they can go to the bathroom and you just kind of snap, right? Like just, no, it's not time, right? Our, our response is um, abrupt. It is not as, you know, positive or gentle as we might hope. And that's okay because we're human. But the more times that we have that kind of reaction, the child is starting to experience that stress as a result as well. And it can impact negatively our relationship with the child. And then because the child is co-regulated to us, that child starts to present challenging behaviors as well, which as you can see, you know, the adult experiences stress and it sort of creates this vicious cycle, right? This is also true in our relationships with adults. If you think about, you know, working with another teacher or working, you know, talking with a family member or a spouse, we have these moments where we snap, right? And then they snap back, right? And so without some sort of way to interrupt this cycle, we end up sort of damaging some of our relationships unless we take action. So one way to sort of mitigate the stress in our interactions with children and in our interactions with our staff, with other teachers, with our spouses, other people in our life, without engaging in some sort of self-care, the cycle cannot be broken. So when we, we experience some sort of stress, we understand our triggers, we understand how they feel, and we engage in some sort of self-care. And from there, you know, we break that cycle. The child does not experience those same high levels of stress. And when I say self-care, I don't mean basic care for yourself, right? Oh, well, I'm going to eat a, eat a good meal or, you know, take a couple extra minutes of a long shower or something. So you have to take time to process what you need and invest in yourself and invest in, you know, rebuilding some of those relationships. Um, as a parent, anytime I have uh, conflict with my child, I always try to go back and repair, right? And say something like, that was not fair to you that I yelled. I was feeling frustrated. I'm going to work on taking a deep breath or, you know, closing my eyes and, and saying a silent prayer, right? Asking for grace, asking for um relief asking for help um, without those additional parts of self-care on top of basic care needs, right? Eating a healthy meal. Um, uh, self-care is more than just meeting those basic needs. And it's important to think about that with young children too, right? Their basic needs need to be met before we can help them connect to us. They need to feel loved. They need to feel safe before they are ready to learn. Some signs of traumatic stress. In preschool children, there might be some separation anxiety. Some of you have probably seen this in your preschoolers, kindergartners, first graders even, that have been you know, in virtual school or homeschool or haven't had a formal school experience yet. But um, traumatic stress might be you know, eating poorly, not engaging with other children, um, crying, a lot, having that separation anxiety from their caregiver, things that impact their ability to establish relationships in the classroom. 
In older elementary school children, it might be um, an anxious um, approach, right? Always asking, you know, is the fire alarm going to go off or, you know, is school going to be closed? Um, feeling guilt or shame and having a hard time concentrating. In middle school and high school children, one of the key indicators is an increase in risky behavior, um, an increase in children being withdrawn, right? Not engaging with caring, responsive adults. Those are all signs that um, it's time for us to step in. This is one of my, my favorite sort of visuals. Um, my sister, whom I love dearly, says she doesn't have emotions. And I always joke with her that she does, she just doesn't always realize what they are because she doesn't have a name for them. And when we're talking about, you know, supporting children, um, supporting our teachers, supporting our families, it's important to use this idea that we are a shepherd to our flock of feelings, that, you know, a shepherd calls the flock by name and that sheep can sort of stray. And so in calling them by name and calling them together, we are able to bring that flock back together. It's a great analogy for our feelings, right? We have certain emotions, anger, joy, um, sadness, frustration, disgust, all of these feelings that are inside of us, right? And sometimes we might lose control over one of those, right? We might overreact, we might scream, we might shout. And so one strategy is name it to tame it, right? Say, I am feeling angry and using a strategy to calm down, right? In naming our um, feelings, we go from that sort of base part of our brain, right? Into naming it, right? Into the upper parts of our brain. So we're able to problem solve. It's also important that we model this process with our children, with children in the classroom. They don't know what normal feelings are unless they see us expressing them, unless they see us talking about it's normal to cry, right? It's normal to feel sad and angry. And so we bring our flock of feelings back together, right? And we, we hold them in our hearts. We um, are able to solve problems when we are shepherds to our flock of feelings. So this is the second part of our conversation today, the seven ways to help educators help students. And so um, this is a, a quick overview. We'll dive a little deeper into each of these strategies, but I want to just note that this is your opportunity to share your ideas, um, share your strategies. I'm seeing there's a, a post in the in the chat here about elaborating on um, self-care. We're going to talk a little bit about strategies focusing on connection, which is one form of self-care um, and helping wire the brain, right? Connecting with um, others, connecting with God helps us to feel that peace, right? To um, sort of fill up our own buckets because we can't pour from an empty cup. So these are strategies to not only, you know, care for ourselves, our spiritual selves, our, our physical and emotional selves, but also how to model to do that with children in the classroom, um, with our teaching teams, with our administrative teams as well. Um, so as I share these ideas or these prompts, these suggestions, there will be a question at the bottom so that you can respond in the chat or grab a piece of paper and a pen nearby, write down your responses um, to help you um, this school year and um, help you find some strategies that work. So the first one is prioritizing relationships. And I realize that a lot of these are easier said than done, but by practicing these, by working through some of these struggles, it becomes habit. And through building these habits, right, we start to, we start to live our, our faith um, through our feelings, through our actions. Um, we start to have this faith into action, right? Showing our children showing our children and their families um, ways that we can live our faith. And one of these is through prioritizing relationships. What does this look like? 
we're listening, we're validating and normalizing children's experiences. Remember that children are grieving normalcy too. This is really important for us to remember that as adults, we have an idea of what normal was. And we've long talked about a return to normalcy, right? And so unfortunately, we have to acknowledge that there is a new normal. And with that involves acknowledging that children might be upset because their friend is in another class. And we're not able to have multiple classes outside at recess together, right? It's just our little learning pod. Um, children might be frustrated, right? And we see this through their behavior. There might be more hitting. There might be more um, yelling, tantrums, you know, even in some of our older kids that we think, you know, should have outgrown it by now. But children are grieving normalcy too. They just might not have the words to describe it. And so our role is to listen to children and interpret their actions, right? What is their behavior trying to tell me? What is my reaction to their behavior trying to tell me? We also want to talk about our feelings, let children know it's okay. Obviously, if you have a big blowout adult fight at home, you don't necessarily want to bring all that into the classroom with you, but rather talk to the children about how you're feeling, right? Say, I'm feeling really sad today. And so I am going to take a couple of deep breaths, right? Model for children how they can help mitigate those that stress, right? We're talking again about that flock of feelings naming our feelings so that children can start to name their feelings too, right? And talk about how you can use your, your faith life to help you with that, right? Tell the children, I am feeling really sad. I am going to pray for peace or I am feeling very overwhelmed. Let's all take a moment to close our eyes and take a deep breath together. Um, modeling again for children, how we can handle these stressors, but also using it as an opportunity to connect with children, right? When you see that a child is upset, get down to their level. And instead of saying, why are you upset? They can't, they can't name it to tame it yet. So talking them through it, say your hands are clenched, you're stomping your feet, right? Normalizing and putting words to what they're doing helps us connect with them, helps us coach them through some of these feelings that they might be having. So my question for you is this, what can you do to prioritize relationships with your students and or fellow staff? Does this involve a group prayer? Does this involve um, creating a ritual to wish well those who aren't with us today, right? Does this involve having a special area of the classroom where you can meet with a child who's having a hard time, right? Is this even as simple as instead of having a red, yellow, green light system on the wall for us as adults to help regulate children's behavior, let them have one on their desk too, right? Say, I'm having a hard time, I need help, or I'm ready to go, right? What are the systems we can put in place to help prioritize those relationships? Tamping down the pressure is the next one. So as I am giving examples, think about one way you can help relieve the pressure we place on students and they place on themselves. This is especially true of our older kiddos who are starting to feel the stress of, you know, mandated testing, of making friends, of connecting with peers, dealing with you know, bullies or frustrating behaviors from, from one another. So it's important to remember each one of us has a different story. And so each one of us is going to have different ways that we show our stress, we show our pressure. Um, for me, I tend to get a little bit overwhelmed and I get angrier faster, right? And so to help myself take that pressure down, I take five deep breaths, or I take one minute to just close my eyes, um, say a little prayer, you know, just 
take a moment to be, right? And so as we're starting to connect and prioritize those relationships with children, um, you know, fostering relationships between peers, we want to have some sort of space for releasing pressure, right? And that comes from modeling strategies for pressure release, right? Thoughtful reflection, having a journaling um, practice built into your daily routines, connecting with others through conversations, right? Maybe having children connect with each other, um, having an emotional check-in each day to build those relationships, providing a moment for children to turn to one another, parents share how you're feeling today, right? As I mentioned before, maybe having those red, yellow, green cards on their desk so that their peers know how they are feeling. We have to model for children these strategies because they don't come naturally. Um, they don't come naturally to us as adults. We often have that ticker tape running through our head of all the things that we need to do, all the requirements for the day, what's next, that schedule as well that's driving our day in the classroom. And so we have to model for children ways that we can release that pressure in a healthy way before it overwhelms us. I'm seeing some great um, responses here. Spending time at the beginning of the year to know, get to know one another, practicing our manners, yep, listening, observing, validating, doing things um, together, trying to be an active listener. These are these are great ways to build these um, ideas into these rituals um, into our day as well. Empowering students. Um, as you are listening, you know, list ways, three ways you can empower students throughout the school year. We all have, you know, great intentions of starting out the school year with an ambitious schedule, right? Having establishing routines, putting in a long bit of work at the beginning of the year into connecting with one another, having a morning meeting or group time, having an afternoon story time, whatever that looks like. And it can be difficult to sustain throughout the year. And so one thing that we need to think about is how we can empower students to be some of those leaders in the classroom, to be um, those resources for their peers, right? In many ways, COVID made it difficult for children, for students, to make their own decisions, right? You don't get to choose who you sit next to at the lunch table. You don't get to choose who you play with after school, right? It's a lot of us telling children what they need to do. And so when we have that freedom, when we are able to give them that freedom to make their own choices again, it can be stressful to them, right? A lot of times anxiety is trying to struggling because we don't have the ability to control things, right? And so COVID sort of put a spotlight on that. Kids were told exactly what to do and when. And once they have that ability to choose, can they handle it? And so it's important for us to know that anxiety is often the result of uncertainty. So we want to empower students to um, be successful by preparing them as much as possible for when they have a free choice, for giving them options, right? Allowing them to pursue passion projects, um, having creative outlets or alternatives to exams like presentations or e-portfolios to demonstrate learning. Um, and again, bringing in our faith into this as well. Having an area for children to have a prayer journal or a place where they can go and look at, um, you know, pictures of their classmates, an area for them to have that quiet reflection built in throughout the day so that they start to seek out those comforts, um, to seek out that guidance when they need it, right? Giving them back some of the power that they have lost over the last couple of um, years in particular. Staying moored in the moment, thinking about our routines throughout the day. Um, does anybody have any ideas about routines in which you can embed reflections or build in brain breaks for students? 
Again, COVID disrupted rituals and routines, which children thrive on. When we think about our faith in particular, right? With that fear of gathering together, we had virtual mass. We had fewer people attending mass, right? Because of that fear of staying healthy, staying well. Um, and so as a result of even changes in that Sunday or Saturday night ritual, depending on the needs of families, um, with that disruption in, in rituals, children thrive on that. They thrive on knowing that, you know, on Sundays we go to church and then we go to breakfast or we go visit grandma and grandpa, whatever the case may be. With those disruptions comes that anxiety again, right? When they come into the classroom, they aren't used to having to sit in a desk by themselves. They aren't used to, you know, being told what to do literally all the time in order to keep them safe. And that results in that sustained fight, flight, or freeze response. So it's important for us to help children to look at the behavior as having meaning, right? Children are wiggly, they're restless, they're dysregulated. We want to help them be mindful, building reflection into the classroom, right? Quiet moments into the daily routine to help calm the nervous system, right? Maybe having a morning prayer, an afternoon prayer, um, having opportunities for the children to stay present. Um, you guys have great, great ideas here in the chat as well. Fostering that social connection. Um, what is one thing you can do to support students in connecting with each other? We talked earlier about fostering or about prioritizing relationships. One thing that this group of children struggles with is connecting with their peers, connecting with each other. There's disrupted social structures due to social distancing, safety regulations. There's a lack of opportunity to engage in informal social play. I can tell you that um, my son for a long time was more interested in spending time with adults because he had spent so much time with just me at home. I used to joke that he was my assistant. I started to notice that he was connected to new toys or new things in his environment. And he was starting to ask for things instead of people, right? Things are predictable. Things are exciting. Things can help him play. It wasn't so scary as, you know, peers of, of kiddos his age, right? It is one thing that we need to consider is how do we help children learn how to play with each other, how to see from other perspectives. And so it's important to make a space for collaborative projects, having discussions or parent share, right? Sort of forced fun, if you will, right? Intentionally pairing children up together so that they can connect, so that they can play in a variety of ways. This could involve, you know, a parent share at group time, turn to a neighbor and tell them one thing that made you happy yesterday, or looking out for one of those kiddos who might be having a hard time making friends and pairing them with a buddy. Promoting self-care. I had mentioned this earlier, that in that cycle of stress, that self-care is you-focused, part of knowing when you need to engage in self-care or a little more self-care than usual is understanding your triggers, right? I used to joke that I didn't know what my pet peeves were until my son told me, right? Like spilling food or, you know, chewing with his mouth open. Um, it's funny to sort of think about, but when we, when we acknowledge what our triggers are, we're able to work through them, right? Recognizing when you're triggered is the first part of mitigating that stress. Once you know what is triggering you, you know, ask yourself the question, um, what is my reaction trying to tell me? What is this feeling I have trying to tell me? You know, what is God trying to tell me? Is it that I need to take a break? Is it that I need to reevaluate this? Do I need to try another strategy? Whatever the case may be, self-care is not selfish, right? It is beyond those basic needs. And so spend some time reflecting on what it is that empties your bucket most so that you can figure out how to fill it back up. That might involve, as I mentioned, um, taking a walk or having moments for prayer built into your day, 
Um, it can also involve a gratitude journal, writing down each day three things for which you are grateful, three blessings that you've had as well. And in promoting self-care for ourselves, we're able to give ideas and strategies to others too. Focusing on joy and simplicity, my dear friend um, Pam Perino likes to talk about prioritizing joy. And this is something that is important as well. The last couple of years have had so much loss and tragedy and that feels like it's hard to see the joy through all of the sadness. But it's important to know that it's no need for grand gestures, just general connection. Finding an opportunity each day to connect with a child, whether that's through a fist bump or a congratulations, you did it, right? Building up on those small things. Communicating how you feel about your students, right? Wearing your heart on your sleeve, saying, I am so proud of you for tackling that challenge. Are you proud of you, right? Finding a way to connect with each child, whether that's a greeting at the door or, you know, getting down on your knees when a child is upset and saying, I see that you're struggling, let me help you. Students will remember what they felt, not necessarily what you taught them, right? You want to be one that walks beside them. And so we do that by showing up, right? Showing up when they're having a hard time. So as you are as we are wrapping up today, consider one thing you can do to create a joyful learning environment. Does that involve ending your day with celebrations? Does that involve including special um, acknowledgement for children who have accomplished something hard, right? Does that involve on Fridays, um, you know, praying for good weather or uh, some sort of celebration, right? What are some of the things that we can build into our time with children to create joy, to bring back joy? Because when we help others celebrate joy, we can celebrate it with them as well. And I will just leave you on this idea that it's all a juggling act. And when we talk about self-care, one of the best pieces of advice that I have is knowing that it is a juggling act, right? You have all these different balls that are in the air and some of them are glass and some of them are plastic. Our relationships with others, they are glass. Our relationship with ourself, our relationship with God, those are the glass balls. And some of those other tasks that we have, they're plastic. And so it's important to know you're going to drop a ball every now and then. It's part of juggling, but it's important to make sure we're holding on to those glass balls because they would break. Those plastic balls, they're going to bounce. They're going to be okay. We can pick them back up when we need to. And so as we connect with others, as we prioritize those relationships, we will start to know what the glass balls are for others and what are plastic so we can help them pick it up and continue the juggling act that we are all doing in working with children in education. All right. Thank you all so much. If you have questions, you can feel free to put them in the chat. I'll turn it back over to Nancy for some additional um, information, as well as some um, open it up for questions here in just a minute. Thank you, Amy. We so appreciate your joy that you shared with us via the Zoom webinar. So thank you for sharing that. While you are gathering your thoughts for those questions that you would like both Amy's to address, just wanted to quickly share with you about the My Emotions videos. And these are a new series of six videos. They do correspond with the Stories of God's Love Early Childhood program, ages four and five in kindergarten, and can be used in a classroom setting, can be used with parents. But each, each uh, video focuses on emotions that young children experience and help them to identify define and use those feelings in an appropriate way. Your shepherd hook there, Amy, uh, helping young people to shepherd, to be shepherds of their own emotions. We do encourage you to join our Early Childhood Facebook page. So check that out and join our group as well. And we also have some free Catholic resources for you for back to school. So go to our RCL Benziger site and there at the store you'll find articles, 
additional videos, uh, some of the uh, previous videos, the Prioritizing Joy with Pamperino is there as well. And if you'd like more information about our early childhood programs or any of our programs, uh, please go to the website and there's catalogs and samplers there. This is an announcement specific specifically for Ohio early childhood educators that if you would like to receive a credit through the OCCRRA, please have your send me, Nancy Bird, your name, your place of employment, your cell phone number, and most importantly, your O. Opine, OPIN number, and uh, we'll make sure that uh, Amy gets that entered into the website so that you can receive credit for the hour that you've spent. So now you get to stay on uh, for uh, a few more minutes while the Amy's uh, address your questions. So again, thank you, and let us know how we can help, and um, Amy and Amy. Thanks, Nancy. So Amy, there's a lot of great comments over here in the chat that respond to your questions. And just uh, for all of you, those of you who are participating, we'll make sure that you receive the chat when you receive the recording of this so that you can capture some of these um, ideas that are over here. But for those creating uh, the rituals, I talked about starting class with prayer and then having an opportunity for um, learners to share an intention so that they they have a space to name it. Um, they talk about uh, in music class, listening to instrumental music and then either write or draw any emotions that get stirred up by it and then sharing their work. I think that would probably work in almost any setting, not just a music class. Um, so brain breaks, they said when they're getting restless to call for a, a break to get the wiggles out and I have a wiggle song and they stand up and get those wiggles out. And Right after this, there's a question about what are brain breaks for middle school, and uh, Amy knows this. I Middle schoolers are my favorite. I love middle school kids, and I would say I wouldn't necessarily call it a wiggle song with middle schoolers, but letting them stand up and move. You know, when, when we're in that pre-adolescence and our bodies are growing faster than they can control, sometimes that physical movement is exactly what they need to kind of reset their minds because, because they're having those rapid periods of growth. So I would say wiggle songs work even for middle schoolers. Um, Hillary reminded us, and I think this is really beautiful, that attending daily mass, adoration, going to confession, receiving the sacraments is a huge form of self-care. You know, just that reminder that Jesus heals us. So let's see, scrolling some more ideas for middle school. A couple of people said, you know, their joy is that they love their chickens. That's really fun. Um, mostly just some other great ideas. Uh, thanks so much. So Amy, I have for you, I have a question. If you had to make up a, a, a brain break on the spot and you have experience, but you just saw that you needed one, what would you do? Oh, this is, this is a good one. Um, I am a singer by nature. So anyone who sees any of the, my emotions videos knows that I sing all the time. And so when I need a break, I usually will sit and come up with a song or put some, a song on to listen to, to sort of help me, help me to move. Um, and my son also started to make up his own songs, which I think is fabulous. Um, and, and when I'm feeling in particularly just run down, um, I think about songs of joy, right? Like joy to the world. I sing a song that is familiar, that takes me back to a good memory, right? Um, I find a way to, to just focus on that gift of music in my life. And whether that's singing or listening to it or noodling on a guitar very poorly, um, that is one way that I try to, to break up that, that stress. Thank you. And I have one more question. So many of our participants are directors of religious education. We had a couple principals, some preschool directors, and you've talked about that value of self-care for the adult and how important that is. So, so if you saw adults who were clearly experiencing the results of some of these traumas, what might be some of those strategies to, to help adults 
um, recognize or experience that that self care that they need to take that own brain break to take care of themselves. What are some of those strategies that if you're an administrator or a principal or a DRE that you might tuck in your back pocket when you see an adult having a hard time? This is a great, great question. And I have sort of two responses. One of them is sort of proactive and one of them is a little bit reactive. Um, in one of the organizations that I work with as a group, when we have like a full staff meeting, um, we include wish wells, we include celebrations. So it creates this um, sort of community feel of trust and vulnerability that when we're wishing well, it might be for somebody that we care for that is having a hard time. It might just be something to say, hey, I, I could use some prayers for myself and leaving it at that. So creating this sort of culture in um, out loud, right? In front of these staff meetings that increase that vulnerability that this is a place where we can connect. This is a place where you are not alone. And when we create that culture, it encourages us to connect on an individual level, which is the second part of my answer, right? Um, finding a way to check in with people in when times are good so that when you can tell somebody is having a hard time, it isn't like out of the blue, right? It isn't, um, you know, sort of a wagging of the finger of the principal at the kid, right? Like what's wrong with you, but rather what happened to you, right? Like, Hey, I've been noticing that you seem a little bit run down, or I'm noticing that something is off. You know, what happened? Is everything okay? what can I do to support you? So it starts sort of with knowing that it's a safe place to have these conversations and then making sure that you have those conversations, if that makes sense. One of the things I really love about that answer, it, both with adults and with children, you're starting with naming what is observable. You know, so you've talked about with kids, helping them understand what happens in their bodies when they experience certain emotions. But I love that the answer you just gave was saying, I've noticed this, you know, this is the part I can see without assigning meaning to it with, with allowing that person to have that opportunity to say, you know, my, my car broke down again and I don't know how I'm going to pay for it. Or I had this huge fight with my spouse or, you know, my kids are just driving me nuts. But, but I love, I love that that you're starting with that observation um, and, and then creating that space for them to respond. Um, and I do think that it is, it is so important that, that, you know, we, we hold that space for, for our faith in here that, you know, when, when we're observing those things that, um, you know, just even saying, in, in not in a, in a condescending way, but in a sincere way, you know, I, I've just noticed that you're having a hard time. I want you to know that I'm praying for you. And if you want to talk about it, I'm here, you know, just that, that sincerity of prayer, I think is also a really valuable gift that we have of, as people of faith that we can extend to both children and adults and to families. Um, Absolutely. And just like hearing that I, I'm praying for you is, is such a powerful thing to hear. Um, and, and like you said, that noticing is so important saying, you know, I'm noticing this observable thing. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's without judgment, right? It is saying something's not right. And I, and I want to help, you know, ease that burden. I want to walk along with you. I want to walk, walk alongside you. Um, yeah. And just that idea that somebody, right. And prioritizing those relationships, somebody is, is praying for, you know, my, my well being. somebody is praying for me is so powerful. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, you know, I'll just say this is, this is a little off topic, but one of my favorite things about being Catholic um, is that in our prayers of intercession, you know, we pray for people experiencing um, and, and I remember that people around the world are praying for things that I'm experiencing today. And that connectedness, I know for me, is always such a great comfort um, that, that even, uh, you know, globally, we have a connection to one another within our church. That's such a beautiful, again, uh, strengthen that, we, that we've had this kind of um, 
shared experience, although albeit to different levels of, of COVID and how that has impacted our lives. And that as we pray for all people who have experienced uh, trauma and difficulty and grief and sadness, um, you know, that that as a church, we are sustaining one another with our prayers that that I always think is like I said, that's one of my favorite parts of being Catholic is just that that connectivity of people um, on that global level. Absolutely. And, and just that knowing that, you know, you're experiencing something. I always say, when we talk about feelings with our kiddos, you should say, I am feeling angry, happy, sad, as opposed to I am angry, right? The ultimate dad joke is hi, angry. Nice to meet you. Right. (laughs) Just to know that we can move through these experiences that are challenging. We can move through these feelings that we're having that are, you know, unpleasant and knowing, like you said, that we are not alone in, you know, people are praying for us around the world that have never met us. will never meet us. Um, because we're experiencing something right. That God is with us, um, that we aren't walking alone as we're moving through those things is so powerful. Absolutely. All right, Miss Nancy, I'm not seeing any more questions as we were having just our little chit chat here. Okay, Um, it was a wonderful chit chat. And uh, most people are just signing off and saying thank you. So again, um, Miss Amy and Miss Amy, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and your joy with us. And uh, watch in the next couple of days for the link to this recording as well as as one of our Amy's said, we'll, we'll send you the chat as well so that you can look at some of the ideas that were shared among the participants. And besides that, know that we will hold you all in our prayers, as Amy said, and uh, we thank you for your time. And please let us know how we can continue to serve you in the future. God bless. Bye-bye. Have a wonderful evening and a great weekend ahead. Thank you. Thank you all.